Um, yeah, so it's great to be here. And uh, as I was preparing this talk, I was trying to think about the uh, the audience, and I didn't really quite know what to assume about the background of the audience. But I, I, I in the end, I, I decided to assume, and this is based on what the organizers told me also, uh, that people are not uh, really don't have much background or haven't heard of a secure computation. So just for my own curiosity, how many people uh, have heard of secure computation? Okay, how many people know something about it? Uh, even a little bit? Okay, so anyway, hopefully you'll, you'll find what I say useful. And, and what I want to get out of this uh, talk, or what I hope you'll get out of this talk, is just an appreciation of what secure computation can offer. Uh, I also go through in just a little bit of detail, a, a very superficial level of detail, uh, some of the basic ideas that are used in constructing modern secure computation protocols, but the goal was not, in, not to dive into deep uh, technical depth uh, and, get, and get into the low-level details of these protocols, because that would be uh, an hour-long talk, even if people had the background. Uh, and so I really just wanted to present some of the basic ideas, but more importantly, to let you understand uh, what is available uh, as a tool nowadays for people who want to maybe use secure computation or ideas from secure computation uh, as part of their research. So, um, you know, I'm happy to stop and take questions at any time if people uh, have any questions. You can think about this maybe more like a classroom lecture and, and interrupt me if you like. Uh, we'll see how far along we get. So I'm going to talk about the, this recent progress in generic secure computation. Let me just motivate uh, the problem space, I guess, for people who are not familiar with the notion at all. And this is not working, I guess. Uh, oh, yes, it may have run out of battery, but it says it's on. Okay. So uh, anyway, we, we know that uh, nowadays right, we're collecting more and more data. Uh, and here we just have uh, examples of maybe two uh, PCs, two laptops, that have each collected various data uh, about various individuals, uh, whether it's different data about the same individuals or maybe it's uh, similar data but about different individuals, whatever the case may be. Uh, it would still be very nice to be able to use this data, and we know that uh, with, with the recent advances in machine learning and, and, uh, and uh, applications of um, uh, deep learning on big data, which sounds like these grandiose terms, um, we're really only beginning to explore how much we can learn from these large volumes of data we're collecting. And uh, for people who think about these things, for people who are kind of paranoid, people who come from the world of cybersecurity, there's always this uh, fundamental tension uh, right, that comes up between, on the one hand, trying to protect as much as possible individual users' privacy. Okay, so here we have a scenario where on the left, maybe this machine has collected information uh, about various people, and let's assume that it did it with, uh, by notifying those users, and the users approved that this machine can collect this information about them, and similarly on the right. And once we start exchanging data between these two machines, kind of all bets are off, right? So nobody, pe the people or the users who gave their data to the machine on the left don't necessarily have any trust relationship with the machine on the right, and may be uncomfortable with the idea that their data will flow to the machine on the right. Right, and if you want to think about this in a, in a um, uh, societal context, right, imagine that these are two different countries uh, collecting data about their citizens, and those countries don't necessarily trust each other. And you have this tension, as I said, between privacy that you obtain, uh, a kind of optimal privacy by just putting up a firewall around each of these machines and forbidding them from talking to each other, uh, versus the utility that you could uh, potentially obtain by collecting all the data, centralizing it in one place, and learning everything you can from the, from the union of the data held by these two machines. And um, what you can see is that resolving this tension right, between privacy and utility would be a lot easier if there were some entity that everybody could trust with their data. Right? Because in that case, what you would do is you would take these various uh, machines, these various collections of data, they would all have this uh, central authority uh, that they would trust. They could each send their data to that central authority. The central authority could then do whatever, run whatever algorithm you want to run over the union of all the data. They could run whatever deep learning algorithm you want on the union of all the data, get the result, return that result, or maybe different uh, aspects of the result, to the different parties that sent their data, that contributed data to this computation, and then afterward maybe erase all the data that they received so that there's no threat of having that data compromised in the future. Okay, and for those of you who don't know, I guess this is uh, the, a picture of the Supreme Court building uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, near where I work. Um, and so going back to our original uh, uh, graphic, right, so here we have these two uh, machines here, and they can rely on that trusted party, that trusted third party, that here it's important that uh, not only that they trust, but also all the users who are involved here, whose data is involved here, also trust. They could use this technique to share their data, collect the data in one location, uh, run whatever mining algorithm they want over it, and obtain the result 
without actually uh, violating the user's privacy. Okay, so you get the kind of best of both worlds. You get privacy and utility if you have this amazing uh, magic trusted party. And of course, uh, the question remains, uh, you know, who, who, who can we trust in the real world? Uh, who can anybody agree is trustworthy? Um, I guess maybe if you know Israeli politics, you know, not, not very many. Um, but uh, no, it's not, not a political statement. Everyone agrees that there's no one you can trust, right? So, um, you know, maybe I, I gave this talk a while back uh, in, in, in the U.S. And I, and I suggested maybe the Supreme Court is somebody that everybody can trust. Nowadays, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe everybody de facto trusts Google. Uh, people don't like to admit it, but if you look at all the data they're sharing, maybe, maybe that's the case. Uh, but in any case, this still leaves us with, with feeling a little bit uncomfortable. And so, as I said, it would be really nice if there were somebody we could trust with all our data. But in practice, I would argue that this is... Um, yeah, so I want to say, in practice, it's unlikely to happen. Of course, you have Google as the exception to that uh, rule. But, but you know, I, I think if you, if you actually think about it and you think about people's um, uh, health records, banking records, uh, you know, passwords, I, I feel I, I don't actually share my passwords with Google. Uh, you may know them anyway, but, but I don't share it with Google. Uh, and there are various things that I do feel uncomfortable sharing with Google. And I would argue that this is not going to change for many reasons. Uh, I, I think there, there, are, there are legal and regulatory restrictions that would prohibit somebody from uh, acting or, or discourage somebody from acting as a trusted third party, even if everyone would agree, you know, yes, this person is trustworthy, they may not be willing to act as a trusted party because they would have a lot of liability if they ended up being hacked, let's say. Something might happen outside of their control even, uh, and they might be unwilling to act as a trusted party. Uh, you can also argue that from, a, from a, uh, an economic perspective, uh, it may not be uh, economically viable. Right? So it's not a, perhaps a good business model to set yourself up as a trusted third party and then have people give you their data and pay you some small amount of money for doing the computation. Uh, you can think about this both from the point of view of what people might be willing to pay for such a service, which is probably uh, uh, you know, not very much. And again, coming back to this question of, of the liability that they would face in case they ended up being hacked and in case the data ended up being leaked. Uh, doing this, even if you completely trust the party, opens them up uh, or, 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 or presents them as a central point of failure and an attractive target for an attacker. So again, even if somebody is perfectly trustworthy, uh, it doesn't mean that somebody external can't come along and, uh, and break in and, and violate those trust assumptions. And also, you, you, you fundamentally, in a lot of cases, have these incompatible trust frameworks. So again, even if you could imagine that everybody in the United States would agree that the Supreme Court is trustworthy, and everybody in China would agree that the uh, equivalent in China is trustworthy, it's unlikely that people in the US will trust the Chinese government uh, and vice versa. So again, it would be nice if uh, there was somebody we could trust with our data. But actually, it's even nicer, from a cryptographic point of view at least, if we can avoid this need for the trusted party uh, in the first place. And what that would allow us to do is to take this uh, a picture that I presented earlier, where we have all the uh, different computers uh, sending their data to the centralized location and then having the computation carried out in that centralized location, we could replace that instead with a distributed protocol that doesn't involve any external entity at all, uh, but which achieves the same functionality, achieves the same net result as what I had on the previous slide. And this is exactly, uh, in, in you know, two slides of pictures, what secure computation protocols guarantee you. So, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more formally, but if, you know, a formal definition can take up a page, but a little bit more formally, right, we'll say that a protocol, a distributed protocol between these parties, um, which, uh, who each have their own local data and execute this protocol and then end up with a result, um, is a protocol, is a secure computation protocol if it provides a faithful emulation of a trusted third party. So if the, well, I'll show another picture in a minute, but if, if that, uh, that picture I had uh, one slide ago of all the parties uh, communicating amongst themselves via a distributed protocol exactly emulates what I had on two slides ago where everybody sends their data to, to a central uh, trusted authority. This is what Bitcoin is doing. Bitcoin is trusted. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a network, uh, virtualized network. So Bitcoin, uh, that's right. So Bitcoin can be viewed uh, in some sense as a secure computation protocol of a particular functionality. Bitcoin actually doesn't really guarantee you any privacy but it does guarantee you uh, correctness and, uh, and certain integrity guarantees. So you could probably cast it as a secure, I mean, you can cast it as a secure, as a, as a particular secure computation, but one that's completely non-private. Uh, but, but you're right about that, about that point. Um, and, and if I go to, um, you know, another uh, picture, we have this um, a little bit more formally, this notion of, of what's called the real ideal paradigm, where what we do is we evaluate the security of a real world protocol by comparing it to uh, what, we would what we would achieve 
in an ideal world in the presence of a, a trusted third party. So here I've simplified it to the case of secure two-party computation where there are two entities, each with their own private input, uh, and they want to compute some function over that input. Uh, and so they execute some protocol, say, uh, in order to do that, resulting in an output of one of the parties, uh, that output being uh, the function that they want to compute, say f, uh, computed over the joint inputs x, comma, y. The malicious party that I've here indicated by a devil uh, is going to output, or, or in general, is going to obtain some view of the execution of the protocol based on all the messages that it received throughout the course of this interaction. Okay, so this is the real world where we have the, the honest party, uh, the adversary, uh, the honest party generates an output according to what the protocol specifies, the attacker takes the view of the protocol execution, and that is basically the sum total of everything it could possibly learn about the execution. And what we do is we compare that to an ideal world where those parties have access to a trusted entity, and what they do is what I had on the, on the previous slide. So they will send their inputs uh, to that party. Uh, the honest party sending its own input, the malicious party sending whatever input it likes. And then that uh, trusted party will compute the value of the function uh, on its own. In this case, I've, I've shown the most general setting where the uh, trusted party computes some function f1 and returns that to the party on the left and computes f2 over the same inputs and returns it to the party on the right. It could be that f1 equals f2. It uh, doesn't have to be. Uh, and then we have, again, the honest party outputting the value of the result of the computation, which is, by definition here, f1, x, y, and the attacker outputting some arbitrary function of what it received from the trusted third party. Okay? And what we say is that this protocol on the, on the left-hand side is a secure protocol. If for every efficient real-world attacker, right, every attacker interacting in the protocol, uh, there's an ideal-world attacker right over here, that has the same effect. And a little bit more formally, the, the uh, joint distribution of the output and the view over here is uh, indistinguishable from the distribution on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, right, what, did the, what could the attacker do? The attacker can send an input of his choice to the trusted party, and then it gets the result, which it's supposed to get, and can compute an arbitrary function of that result. So in particular, it's not learning anything in the ideal world, about the, uh, this party's input x beyond what it can derive from f2 of xy. Uh, it also can't influence correctness. It, it, can't, it can't make the output of this guy be incorrect other than the fact that it can maybe substitute an, uh, an input value y. Um, so, so that guarantees that the same properties will hold in the real world protocol on the left hand side as well. Was that a question or? Uh yeah? So does this extend to many iterations? That is, if I um, take part in this computation 10 times, I don't gain more than someone in this ideal world? Yeah, that is a great question. And the, uh, fu the fundamental answer is yes. I mean, you have to prove it. But you can show that, uh, that if you have the right definition, then uh, it, it composes. So if you run a secure protocol 10 times in a row, it's equivalent to doing 10 computations of the ideal functionality. Although I should say that there are interesting questions about if you so, so I, what I said before holds for sequential composition when you run them one after each other. Uh, things get a little messier when you talk about interleaving and, and running things in parallel and maybe arbitrary scheduling and things like that. But, but roughly speaking, it does, it does compose under the right conditions. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Um, yeah? What is the real uh, use case? Uh, why is the system uh, useful when the attacker can send any arbitrary y? Yeah, so I think first of all, uh, that, that is a great question. And, and in general, I think this is a problem that's not unique to secure computation. It's really any, any kind of protocol where you have adversarially supplied inputs. Uh, it's a potential problem. Um, I think that the, um, so I can give you a, a couple of settings maybe where, um, uh, where, where you can, uh, either it doesn't matter or you, can, um, uh, or, or you can account for it in the protocol. So one kind of uh, you know, easy example is let's say they're running a secure kind of an auction and there are more than two parties say. So the attacker can bid a million dollars if it wants, but then it's going to be stuck, you know, let's say, paying a million dollars for the item. So it's true that it can always win the auction by, by bidding a huge amount, but then it's going to be forced, just like in the real world, if you bid a lot at an auction, you have to pay the result afterward. Uh, another example might be, you know, you're computing the averages among some sensors in a, in a network, uh, and there maybe, let, let's just say it's temperature averages. Uh, so what you can do, so the attacker can, you know, shift its temperature, and maybe it's 25 degrees, but it shifts it to 27 degrees. And there's nothing you can really fundamentally do about that. But if it shifts it to 127 degrees, you can, you know, as part of the protocol, you can reject that as an obvious outlier. 
Uh, and why is it useful? Well, even if the attacker shifts it by two degrees, the global average is not going to change by very much. So the, I mean, you have to look at it in, in a case-by-case in case scenario to make sure that there's no issue. Um, but, um, but that is an issue that has to be dealt with. That's true. Other? OK. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, so, so a secure computation protocol guarantees confidentiality. right? Nothing about uh, any party's input is revealed beyond what's implied by the result of the computation. Uh, it guarantees this form of integrity or correctness, uh, namely that the correct output, the, the honest parties in the protocol get a correct output. Right? So you know, not the correct output, because like you were saying, the attacker can change its input. But they're guaranteed to get an output consistent with some input. And more to the point, if you have a multi-party protocol, uh, and let's say everybody's supposed to get the same output, then in fact, whatever input the attacker gives, it will be ensured that every honest party gets the same output. Uh, and you also get things like availability, depending on the setting, uh, namely that the attacker can't carry out a denial of service and prevent the honest parties from getting the, uh, the output at all. Uh, you also have more subtle properties that maybe I'll just skip uh, in the interest of time. Um, and I will say, though, that, the, that the, um, you know, I glossed over a couple of things, one of which I'll come back to. But there are questions. So whenever you have a secure computation protocol, um, the protocol will typically make certain assumptions uh, about, about the attacker. And in particular, the important ones to focus on are what is the assumed behavior of the, uh, of the malicious parties, um, which I'll come back to later, and also the number, the total number of corrupted parties that you can have. So in the two-party setting, it really only makes sense to have one party honest, one party corrupted. But in, a, in an n-party setting, you can have you know, one corruption, you can have 10 corruptions, you can have half corruptions, you can have n minus 1 corruptions. And different protocols will give you different trade-offs in terms of what uh, number of corrupted parties they can handle. And some protocols give you weaker guarantees, but I'm not going to focus on that in this talk. So in the remainder of the talk, I, I will, I will, I, I've done most of the background on secure computation. I'll talk briefly about uh, the different threat models. Uh, and then I'll just mention in a slide or two uh, kind of the generic feasibility results, which basically tell us that everything we want to do is possible. And then I will uh, talk about garbled circuits. I think maybe in the interest of time, I, I will, uh, let's see how, how it goes. Uh, and then just talk a little bit about some recent progress in my group on uh, improving the uh, efficiency in particular of uh, two-party and multi-party computation. And, and the upshot, again, what I, what I want you to take away from this talk um, is that, that you can, you can if, if, you, if you're interested in using these ideas, if you're interested in applying secure computation in some uh, networking application, to uh, a, a first order of approximation, you can take off the shelf existing protocols and plug them in and use them uh, for your application. And, and, and they're efficient enough, again, as I said, to be kind of a first order solution. Uh, and if you're uh, interested in using that uh, for your application, you should at least evaluate that approach before looking at other more specialized approaches or more, uh, more tailored approaches uh, or, or giving up altogether. Okay. So, um, right, so, so basically there are two uh, main threat models that people consider when they talk about secure computation. Uh, the first is the uh, so-called semi-honest uh, threat model, also called honest but curious. And what this model basically says is that, yeah, the attacker can corrupt some number of parties running the protocol, but they're all going to follow the protocol faithfully. Okay, if you think about it in terms of the software that's actually executing the protocol, this means that they're not modifying the software running on their machines. So what are they doing? Well, what they're doing is they're looking, uh, like I said earlier, at their view of the protocol execution. And if you have multiple parties all corrupted, they can, they can um, uh, uh, you know, combine their views together and try to learn what they can from the combination of all those views. Okay, and um, it's a re I would argue that, it's, that it is a reasonable threat model in some scenarios. Um, there are scenarios where you have actually what I would call trusted parties, but for legal and policy constraints, they're not allowed to uh, leak one kind of data to the other, right? So doctors, for example, right? They're they're kind of you know you trust them, but they're legally constrained from giving their patients' records to the other doctor. Uh, so you trust them perhaps that they're that they're going to run the software. I guess if they're a, if they're a medical doctor, they're not going to modify or hack the software. Um, but um, you, know, you, you may not trust or you may be worried about somebody who, after the fact, compromises their machine, looks at the protocol messages, and then learns some information. You can also do things like auditing or maybe software attestation to guarantee that people are running uh, the correct code. And then the stronger, or the strongest, actually, uh, notion of security is protection against a malicious attacker 
Where here, we make no assumptions at all about what the attacker does. They can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol, do whatever they want in order to try to, uh, to break the protocol guarantees. Now, I mentioned uh, about these feasibility results. And uh, in one slide, I mean, this is basically it. That, that, that like I said earlier, uh, everything we want to do is possible. So we know that uh, you can securely compute uh, any function f with security against malicious behavior, arbitrary behavior, of any number of corrupted parties. Okay, so if you have an n-party computation, you can secure against n minus one of them. And you may wonder, right, how can you prove uh, a result like this for an arbitrary function f? Well, the way you do it actually is you you take their function f, you know that f can be represented, say, as a Boolean circuit, and then you show how, given any Boolean circuit, you can construct a protocol that will securely compute that Boolean circuit. And one thing I'll mention is that uh, Boolean circuits are historically the model of computation that people worked with when designing secure computation protocols, but in fact, um, uh, you can use uh, alternate approaches, and a lot of work nowadays is fo focused, actually, on trying to use other approaches uh, beyond Boolean circuits in order to construct secure computation protocols. Uh, most interesting, from my point of view, is, is trying to work directly in the RAM model of computation, which is the way that we actually, I think, uh, more naturally think about computation uh, going on inside of a computer, whether it's uh, in, in C code that you're writing or whether it's at the level of the von Neumann architecture that's running on your, on your computer. Um, so I, I, in the title, I talk about generic secure computation. So let me define what I mean by a generic uh, protocol. So um, let's see, what I, what I said earlier is that we have these results, these feasibility results, that show how to take any Boolean circuit and then come up with a secure protocol of computing that circuit. So what that means now is that from a uh, feasibility point of view, for any particular function of interest, right, if you have a particular function for some application uh, and you're trying to design uh, a privacy-preserving protocol for that, all you need to do is take your function f, represent it in some given model of computation, say as a Boolean circuit, and then apply the generic result uh, the, that, that gives you a protocol from any Boolean circuit. And so in particular, any improvements, any efficiency improvements that you have in the protocols for going from a Boolean circuit to a, to, uh, to a protocol, let, let me call it a compiler, so any, any uh, efficiency improvements you have in that compiler will automatically translate to any particular function f of interest that you want to securely compute. Okay. Um, and let me compare that to what I would call a tailored protocol, where with a tailored protocol, what you do is you take a particular function f, and then you try to design a specially optimized protocol for that particular f. So it's not going to translate to other functions, but you don't care. You only care about this one function. Um, and w the hope is that you, know, you can come up with something better than what you would get by applying these generic techniques. And there's lots of work uh, on this. If you look at the literature, uh, there's lots of work actually even outside the cryptographic literature, right? There are, you know, in the networking literature or in the database literature, people have some function that they want to compute securely and they come up with some random protocol for securely computing that function. And, you know, if you think about the relative advantages and disadvantages, right? So the advantages of the generic approach, I think, are, are pretty clear, right? The uh, advantage of the generic approach, or the advantage is, are that the protocol design is essentially for free. So not only do we have these mental compilers that, that tell us that you can go from a Boolean circuit, say, to a protocol, we now actually have uh, real you know, software uh, compilers that can take either uh, uh, some code in a high-level language, or they can take some description of a Boolean, file, of a Boolean circuit in some domain-specific language, and actually compile that to uh, the code for executing the protocol. So in that sense, the protocol design is completely for free. You just download one of these tools, you express your function as a Boolean circuit, which isn't so easy, by the way, but, but at least it can be done. Uh, and then you can compile it, uh, run the existing compiler, and get a protocol. Uh, the implementation is free from that point of view because the compiler gives it to you. Uh, and it's more, uh, more modular. L let me skip that. But, but it, you, know, you, you, you can kind of, if you want to tweak your function, rather than having to design everything again from scratch, you can just you know, add a gate to the Boolean circuit and again, run the re recompile. Now, the main disadvantage, and this is what people claim when, when they write papers designing uh, the special tailored protocols, is that these generic approaches are going to be completely inefficient. Okay? And uh, there, there are various papers you can even cite to, I, I didn't do that here, that specifically claim, they say, well, you know, we want to compute it, we know that we can compute it generically using existing protocols, those are completely impractical, so we're going to design our own protocol. And the question to ask is whether that is really true. And uh, in older versions of this talk, I actually, um, when I compared the two, 
I, I think in the end, what I, what I would want to say for now is that uh, it turns out that the statement is, uh, let, let me say, it needs to be evaluated. So uh, if you are coming up with your own protocol for something, um, you should at least first evaluate what the efficiency, what the cost would be for applying a generic approach to your protocol. And what we find, looking back historically, is that in many cases, if you take these papers that, that designed a special protocol for some specific function, they would have been better off, actually, in terms of efficiency, just applying the generic approach. So um, uh, very often, uh, you actually can do fine by, um, uh, by using a generic approach. And in, in many cases where it's not the case, where, where a tailored approach can do better, the gain is small. It's, it's you know, 10%, 20%, which I guess is big for applied people. But uh, you know, it's not like it's a, it's, a, it's a 10x or 100x improvement. It's a small improvement. And the disadvantages of designing your own protocol are that, you know, uh, unless you're familiar with these things and, and have studied the, the definitions, it's very easy to make a mistake and come up with something you think is secure but is actually not. So let's see how I'm doing on time. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump a little bit and uh, uh, skip this part. Th this was a, I'm going to give a little background of um, uh, some techniques. Um, let, me, let me just say the following, actually. So, so there's this magical tool uh, called a garbled circuit. And what the garbled circuit allows you to do, actually, is to take uh, a Boolean circuit for a function and replace it by a cryptographic object that allows one party, say in this case uh, P2, to evaluate the circuit without learning any of the values on the intermediate wires of that circuit. Okay? And uh, this is great from a privacy point of view because it exactly you can think about how this is going to map to the setting of secure two-party computation. Uh, what P1 is going to do is it's going to construct a Boolean circuit, it's going to construct a garbled version of the Boolean circuit for the function that these parties want to compute. Uh, also in such a way that embeds its own inputs into the uh, input wires of this garbled circuit. Um, what I claim is that if P2 has um, uh, cryptographic values corresponding to each of these input wires, then it can evaluate the circuit and learn an actual uh, Boolean value for the output wire. So we're in a case now where P1 will uh, encode the values for its own input wires. And then what we're left with, so that's the circles here. Uh, it can send those values, or I call them keys. And then what's left is for P2 to obtain one of the two possible uh, keys for its own input wires. So in particular, if, uh, if this corresponds to an input wire of P2, and if P2 holds a zero bit on that input wire, it should receive a key uh, k1 comma 0 and if it holds a 1 on that input wire it should then uh, be able to obtain the key uh, k key 1 comma 1 okay now if it tells p1 which key to send it that's going to violate its own privacy so what we use is another uh, magical tool uh, called oblivious transfer that exactly allows uh, p p1 to send the two possible keys for each wire p2 to send to this box uh, the value uh, of the bit corresponding to its input on that wire, and then learn exactly the corresponding key uh, for that wire. And it's really amazing, actually, just historically speaking. So OT was, was uh, uh, pretty much um, uh, in invented by Michael Rabin. And you know, for, for with, with this, not in mind at all. So I mean, he was thinking of different applications and, and different settings. But it turns out to be a very key component of secure computation protocols, exactly because it allows this selection of one out of two uh, secrets, uh, allowing P1 to learn nothing and P2 to learn exactly one of the two secrets. And then in practice, what you do is you instantiate that box with a small subroutine, a protocol, uh, a small protocol that the parties can run to, it, to uh, exactly compute that functionality. That's a very uh, 10,000 foot view of basic secure computation. And you know, this question of efficiency that I mentioned before right, is an interesting one, because I, I think that the, um, the general perception in the uh, 80s and 90s was that garbled circuits were, were never going to be practical. So I, so I wasn't really around I'm, in the 80s. And I mean, I was around, but I wasn't uh, you know, doing this stuff in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so I don't know, maybe somebody who was around then can tell me if this is true. But I think you know, reading the literature from that time period, I think that, that's the impression. And why is that the case? So why did people think this was never going to be practical? Um, first of all, you have this problem of needing to express your function f as a Boolean circuit. Now we know that in principle every function can be expressed as a Boolean circuit, but we also know that you can have a, a five-line C program that you know, unrolls to a 100,000 gate circuit. Right? Just think you, know, you have uh, for i equals 1 to 100, i, I plus plus. 
right? That's going to be a depth 100 circuit, you know, plus the logic for the addition. And so in practice, if you just kind of naively take uh, code and generate a Boolean circuit from it, these circuits tend to get very big very quickly. And it's not uncommon to have uh, a billion gates, 10 billion gates, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Of course, you can try to optimize, and it's interesting to look at techniques for minimizing these circuits. But at least if you just do it naively, you're, you're likely to get a big circuit. Um, if you look back at the protocol I had on the previous slide and, and do the counting, uh, what you get is that you need to do a number of uh, symmetric key cryptographic operations linear in the circuit size, linear in the number of gates in the circuit. So we're talking about a billion uh, encryptions, let's say, uh, order of a billion, so it's four billion maybe. Uh, and a number of public key operations, and this is for the oblivious transfer, linear in the length of the inputs. So if you have you know, a megabyte input, you're talking about doing a million public key operations just to compute this circuit. So completely impractical, right? Um, and uh, indeed, uh, up to 2010 or so, so it's interesting, in 2004 was the first uh, implementation of the semi-honest protocol I showed earlier. Uh, that was the fair play protocol. And what I'm showing here are the number of gates uh, that they were able to evaluate per second, uh, about 1,500 gates per second, and the maximum number of gates that they were able to support before basically exhausting uh, memory. And then we had some progress in 2009, again in, two, in 2010. Um, but what's interesting is that not only do we continue, of course, to have performance improvements in the, in the hardware, uh, but there have been several notable um, uh, protocol level and implementation level improvements as well. Um, I, I'm not going to go into what these are in detail. Uh, I'll just mention this last one, which is my own work in, in 2011 with um, uh, a postdoc and a graduate student uh, of mine uh, and another collaborator, um, where we introduced the idea of pipelining as a way to, efficient, to more efficiently uh, schedule the way the cryptographic operations and communication were being done, uh, and also looked at developing optimized circuit libraries that could be used as subroutines uh, inside larger protocols. And we showed, actually, that you know, combining all these things together, you get dramatic improvements, actually. So this was the 2011, uh, where you look at the number of gates that we were able to support uh, per second, uh, and the number of gates we were able to, to support uh, before running out of memory. And, and I think we didn't even run out of memory because of the pipelining. And basically, at that point in time, we were able to do uh, circuits with 1 billion gates at a, at a cost of about 10 uh, microseconds per gate. Okay? And I think the takeaway from that, for, for me anyway, was that secure computation can be efficient for uh, moderately sized circuits, and at least if you're happy with semi-honest security. So this, these, all, all these results here are for semi-honest security. Uh, and they don't say anything about what happens with a malicious attacker. So uh, the question of a malicious attacker is a very interesting one. Um, I'll go through just one, one, one thing very quickly, and I'll skip the second thing. Um, so if you go back to this protocol I had earlier for semi-honest two-party computation, the first thing I said was that P1 is going to generate a garbled circuit for the function. Uh, of interest and send it to P2. And the obvious question is, well, if P1 is malicious and can behave arbitrarily, then in particular it can completely uh, modify this garbled circuit and in particular generate a garbled circuit for any function it likes. Right? Maybe it generates the, the, the function uh, f x comma y equals y, right? and it learns the other party's input. So how do you prevent that? And one general way of dealing with that, which was analyzed, first analyzed in 2007, is this idea called cut and choose where what you do is you force P1 now to send many, many copies of uh, independent copies of a garbled circuit. And then what P2 is going to do is going to challenge P1 to prove, say, that half of them were constructed correctly. Okay? And so P1 will then open half of those, show that they were computed correctly, and then you go ahead and evaluate the remaining half. Okay? And you can analyze this. It's a com combinatorial type problem. You have to be a little bit clever, actually. It's not as easy as I made it sound. But you can basically analyze this uh, and show uh, the kind of expected uh, result, well, yeah, I guess I'll go through it here. You can design protocols where for P2 to get the correct result, uh, if and only if uh, at least one evaluation circuit, one of the circuits that it evaluates, uh, is correct. On the other hand, P2 catches P1 cheating if any of the circuits it challenges on is actually incorrect. And so what you get is that you, uh, if you send uh, row circuits, you get 2 to the minus row security. So maybe row equals 80 or, or 60, whatever whatever you're comfortable with, uh, is an appropriate uh, value. Is that zero knowledge proof? Uh, it is similar to zero-knowledge proof. I mean, cut and choose was actually used previously in the context of zero-knowledge proof, so it's borrowing that idea. Yeah. Now let me skip some of this. And let me skip some of this. OK, so then um, we um, uh, have some recent improvements uh, that were published earlier this year. 
uh, on improvement to this cut and choose approach. Um, we have an implementation. Actually, if people are interested in playing around and using it for your application, uh, you can go to, uh, to GitHub and download this implementation of a toolkit, which allows you basically to specify a function of interest using some uh, relatively high level language and then compile it to a secure computation protocol. And um, what, what I want to highlight in particular here is that the, the uh, improvements, well, it's been, it's been improving uh, roughly exponentially. So this is, again, just a snapshot in time of um, the time required for a secure evaluation of AES uh, from 2009, 11, 14, 15, and then our recent work in 2017. And this is a logarithmic scale. Okay, so things are you know, kind of roughly in, in, uh, improving at an exponential rate. It's a little hard to compare because the hardware varies in each of these, but yeah. Um, yeah, and this, if you're interested, uh, you, you, you can get basically, um, if you want to try to calculate, you know, what it would cost to execute some function, it's basically, um, you know, 4.4 now microseconds per bit. This is for malicious security now. Uh, and then you can calculate based on the number of input bits and whatnot, uh, the total cost of the protocol. The other thing I'll just briefly mention in the two minutes I have left is looking at alternate approaches. So one uh, problem with this, with this uh, cut and choose approach to malicious security is that if you want, say, 80-bit security, you have to send 80 of these garbled circuits. And these garbled circuits are large. They're, they're in particular uh, uh, about 100 times, more than 100 times uh, bigger than the circuit itself. The circuit itself may already be large. It may have a billion gates. And so you're paying uh, quite a cost here by using uh, the cut and choose approach. And we, we're looking or continuing to look at uh, the feasibility of other approaches for obtaining malicious security. And one thing we looked at recently in a paper that's uh, now available on, uh, on ePrint or a series of papers on ePrint is using what we call authenticated garbling, where rather than sending, uh, rather than one party computing row circuits and sending them and then having them challenged by the other party, what we do is we have the parties work together in kind of a pseudo secure computation protocol to generate a single garbled circuit. And we do it in such a way that neither party actually knows all the secret values uh, inside that garbled circuit. And we use uh, what we call authenticated values to prevent and detect malicious behavior by any one of the parties. So basically, if they try to manipulate the, the structure of the circuit, they're very likely to get caught. And this actually gives us uh, improvements even beyond the 2017 paper I just mentioned. Uh, so we have now, this is for, uh, it must be for AES, uh, malicious AES evaluation. Um, in the uh, Eurocrypt 2017 paper, we had 42 milliseconds. Now we push it down to about 17 uh, milliseconds. Uh, for doing that. So, so things just continue improving. And the other nice thing about it is that it very nicely extends to the multi-party setting. So if you think about the cut and choose technique, it's complicated to think about how that might extend to a setting with n parties, right? It's not clear who challenges whom and who constructs the circuits, whatever. But it turns out the authenticated garbling technique does, right? So now all you do is you have the n parties collaboratively work to generate a single garbled circuit, and then one party evaluates it uh, uh, and then um, uh, and gets the result. And this gives you not only uh, a constant round protocol, it also gives you security against any n minus 1 uh, colluding malicious parties. And uh, what we've done recently is taken this idea and shown, um, uh, how to, uh, and shown that it's actually feasible to do this on a global scale. So what we did was we uh, actually did, uh, we, we implemented this protocol, ran it in, uh, on several Amazon EC2 instances on servers spread around the world and showed in particular secure computation of AES uh, uh, among 128 different parties across five continents with an online time of only two seconds. And this is, uh, I, I, as far as I know, uh, the largest um, demonstration of secure computation in terms of number of parties uh, that, that, uh, that people have ever done. I, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to quote a number, but the, the largest other that I know of is about 10 parties, and we scaled to about 100 plus. So just to conclude, I, I would say that there's uh, been tremendous advances in generic secure computation in the last few years. And I'll reiterate this point that if you're interested in using, uh, if, if you're interested in, in um, uh, plugging in some privacy preserving protocol for some particular application of interest, you should evaluate what the cost would be of doing it using these generic off the shelf protocols before trying to design your own special purpose protocol. And I would argue that in many cases that would already be uh, efficient enough for, for your purposes. Um, there's also recent interest in these ideas in industry. I can talk to people afterward if you're interested. Maybe we'll see greater deployment uh, in the near future. And I'll thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Any other questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah.
selfish here. So, uh, so you talked about the Gauss circuit based approaches, uh, but maybe uh, there can be scenario where maybe arithmetic circuit or RAM circuit or combinations can be interesting. So, some thoughts? On yeah, so it's actually interesting. Um, there have been some protocols, so, so let's look at arithmetic and Boolean circuits. There are some protocols designed for arithmetic circuits, and I think there, there can be very niche applications where those are better, but I think in the, in, in, they, they do very poorly in other settings. So like comparisons, for example, they, they fail miserably uh, for comparisons. And so I think actually, um, you know, Boolean versus arithmetic, Boolean is the way to go. A RAM model computation is interesting to look at, uh, we have a paper, uh, some papers doing RAM model computation. The problem is that right now the overhead seems uh, unacceptably high and we don't know what to do about it. But maybe, you know, we can keep pushing in that direction and see what we can get. Yeah. And which real-world applications do you think are especially promising? From well, I, you know, I mentioned on the, on the slide here that there is interest in industry and there have been a couple of real-world deployments of secure computation. So uh, let me mention a couple. So, um, so Google is using a form of secure computation uh, when it, uh, I don't know the, the entire specifics, but I think what they're doing is they are uh, interacting with uh, merchants to allow the merchants to learn whether a, whether a user's click on an ad resulted in a purchase. And they're doing a, a, a two-party computation of a certain sort to learn, to let the, the merchant learn about whether the click resulted in a purchase without either side learning any more than that. So they're already using that. Um, there was another example in Estonia of a company called ShareMind which used a, uh, a secure computation system of their own to analyze uh, government data. They were, I, I, again, I don't know the specifics, but I think they were taking one set of data which included uh, tax returns and another set of data which included student enrollment numbers, and they were trying to correlate the two without learning information about anyone in particular. Um, and then finally, I'll mention that there, there's a, a, at least a couple of startups looking at this. Uh, one uh, in particular, um, uh, based partly in Israel, where they're trying to use two-party computation to, um, to verify uh, uh, passwords on login, with the idea being that if, any, if either one of the servers is compromised, you don't get the, the whole password file. So there are, there are some applications now where people are starting to push it out in the real world.